Welcome. Hi, my name is Tamara Turkai uh, with Engaged Agility. We're here and we're going to record this. So if you do not wish to be recorded with your picture or your voice, well, that's okay. We understand. But hopefully you don't mind and you'll engage with us. So, uh, but please know that uh, we are going to keep this pretty informal and we're going to love for you to unmute yourself and just ask your questions. There's no need to, you know, if you want to chat, I'll watch it for the guys. But ultimately, we here, we believe that learning is so much more than just reading slides. So we want to put the engaged and engaged agility here for you. So engage with us, engage with the, uh, the panel, and uh, we'd love to get started. So um, let's go ahead and do some introductions real quick. Ryan, if you want to push the slide real quick. So you want to go over that agenda yeah. and outcomes? Yeah, Perfect. sure. Awesome. I'll go over the agenda real quick since I'm talking. So overall, guys, we're here to kind of help make sure that you're aware of the SPC handbook and uh, share some tips and basically um, have you be able to meet with the panel of uh, learning a little bit more in terms of like change agents, people leaders, and trainers. So we will have a breakout and you'll be able to choose whichever breakout you want to go to and uh, we'll make sure you're aware of what your choices are. And then we'll regroup for Q&A. So sound good? All right, outcomes that we hope you're going to walk away with. So obviously awareness of the handbook. We've actually had some folks that I just must have missed some of the communications from SAI. And so we want to do our part to help make sure that everybody is aware of it and its contents. Uh, understanding about the role of the SPC role and what it's evolving to and what we see as maybe some of the future direction. And also to share our knowledge of the code of conduct and other guidelines that have now been consolidated because this has long been an issue, I think, with SAI and help provide some insights from those of us who are practitioners. And obviously you guys here are practitioners too. So it's gonna be a really wonderful experience just to kind of have community and talk with each other. And uh, for those of us are those people that are newer to their certification, we wanna obviously provide that opportunity to give confidence and understanding of how to be compliant with some of those regulations. I will freely admit, I'm one of those people that as uh, some of the information has been shared, I'm like, oop, I broke the law already, guys. I guess I'm gonna <laughs> fix that. So we'll, uh, we'll make sure that everybody's being compliant. All right, so hi, let me introduce myself. My name is Tam Turkai. Um, I've been practicing for way too long in a more private sphere in the automotive industry and have since been out in the consulting world for, um, I think it's been a Tad, is it four years, five years? I don't know. I get lost tracks. Four or five years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and have um, been coaching and consulting and teaching. And anybody who knows me knows that ultimately my passion is in teaching and um, have been very, very fortunate to have found Matt and the folks here because I've been able to just use that muscle and I adore it and uh, just want to continue to do that as much as I can. So welcome, and I'll be your moderator slash more person behind the scenes. We are recording again just for anybody who's come on, and uh, we'll help watch the chat for the guys. So I'm going to let's go ahead and introduce the rest. Good evening, everyone. I'm Matt Lassiter. Uh, I founded Engaged Agility in 2020, and when I did, it was just going to be me, and it was going to be great. I was going to do a little bit of training and a little bit of consulting. It was going to be wonderful. COVID had other ideas, and uh, I started working with Ryan, and he's the one that convinced me that this was a good strategy, even though he doesn't know it. I said, you know what? really like working with good people. And Ryan was really the first kind of full-time person that came over and said, I want to do stuff. And, and ever since then, I've kind of tried to focus on working with good people there's good people all over this room. And not only do I like working with good people from a working relationship, but I enjoy having good people in my classes. I love working with good people as clients. I now consider it a strategic advantage of working with good people. And I don't understand why everybody in the world doesn't do it, but I will take what I can. So we appreciate you guys being here. As Tam said, we, we really do try to focus on being engaging in everything that we do. Hopefully if you've been through some of our classes, and I know there's several of you that have, then uh, you've, you've seen that come to life. And if you haven't seen it come to life, then we've got this webinar and many more where you can test our engagedness, if that's a word. So thank you for coming. <laughs> awesome. I guess that leads it to me. Um, my name is Ryan Zokol. I'm up here in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. 
Um, so I don't know if I'm the only Canadian here, maybe, maybe not. Looks like maybe. Um, I, um, yeah, I started working with Matt around, uh, I think it was twen end of 2020 or the beginning of 2021 was our um, start time. But I have a little bit of a, an interesting past. I um, have a huge athletic background. I was a national gold medal rower and a provincial gold medal swimmer when I was younger. Uh, went to school for marketing and ran a dental institute running dental courses internationally for around six years. Um, went to school and uh, also got a degree in business operations and management. I love business strategy. And I've also around 12 plus years in coaching, consulting, um, and personal development and transformation performance. So I love I love so many different areas, which makes this such a great fit um, as SPC because I love everything that takes for like people and organizations to thrive and work. Um, I'm also currently on the path to become an SPC T as well. So if anybody has any questions about that, I know we have a couple SPCTs here, but if anybody is on the path to that, we can have some conversations around that as well. Um, I'm going to now pass it on to Alan. Over to you. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Alan Daly. Uh, I spent 25 years or so as a software engineer and in that realm of technology contributor and kind of discovered the Agile Manifesto and thought, how did I miss this way back then? And and got excited about the creative side of technology work, the human side of technology work. And so I see the Agile Manifesto and frameworks and so on as, so far, the, the best set of principles to get the human side of our work as a strength instead of as a weakness. Um, at training in all of my coaching work, I've been doing coaching work for over 15 years now, uh, and training has always been a part of it, and I'm excited about training. I always love those aha moments that people have when I'm helping them. And so coaching and training has been a very wonderful time for me in more, for more than a decade, and I'm happy to be here as part of Engage Agility. And next, I think, is Tad. Hi. So I'll round out this, uh, this crew of folks. My name is Tad Beatty. Um, I've gotten into this. Some of you guys have, have met me before some, and been in classes. Uh, I do a lot of teaching and coaching. I'm actually a failed social worker turned software de developer turned agile coach. So about six years ago, I learned about the scaled agile framework, and, and that really excited me. I, there was a lot of information in there that... I found very useful, and so I, I picked up the, the, the Scale Agile framework and got my SPC very, <laughs> very quickly, and have just carried with that ever since. And I just, I, I love the framework. Uh, you know, I, I love finding good people to work with, and this is a really solid crew of folks. So, thanks, guys. All right, so Tam, I'm going to pass it back. Actually, I think this is going back to you guys. And can we just do a quick sound check? Folks, can you have your hearing? I, I mean, I, are we here? You guys are hearing us, right? Because I'm hearing the folks talking and um, based on the chat, people are hearing. Yeah. So, okay. We've got just a few Good. people that might have to log out and come back in. Okay. Great. So let me let me step in here. I'll go. I'll, I'm, I'm supposed to be the one talking to these next few slides. Uh, so first of all, we're here to talk about the new SPC handbook. This is a new thing, and that's all, that's what this whole webinar is about. And this slide is to emphasize the URL to get that handbook. We've been informed by Scaled Agile that the handbook will be is is in you know can be in continuous iteration. And so to always get the latest one, if you go to this URL, the Bitly URL, you will always land on the latest PDF of the handbook. So please go do that, and remember to do that. Keep this URL handly, hand, handy, and then whenever you want to reference the handbook, obviously you can go look at the PDF you already downloaded, but it might be good to hit this uh, link and go see what might be new there. Great. Um, SPC is exciting work. I've been doing um, scaled agile kind of consulting and SPC work for, for some number of years now. And... It's really exciting how the SPC credential opens doors to you, but it also, uh, the learning that you gain when you get that credential and the learning you get while you're working allows you to have broad impact, big impact on organizations. 
you can do things like come into an agile release train that is is struggling to have a good PI planning event and six months later later have other parts of the company coming to visit to see how great it is because it has improved so much. That's a story from my past and it can be a story in your future as you use your SPC skills and so on. And so this serving as an SPC with these, this is the responsibility wheel of the SPC where we're, we're embodying a mindset, that lean agile mindset, leading change, implementing things, uh, coaching flow, which is an exciting new area in the 6.0 version, and accelerating business agility. These are all things that that make this role, whether you're internal or external, an exciting one. Next slide. Um, SPCs can wear many hats. Now, in the handbook, they highlight these different hats and different kind of configurations of what an SPC might be involved with. So internally, first of all, there's the internal positions, meaning you're an employee of the company that you're helping to become more agile and use the scaled agile framework. And you can also be external. You might be a hired contractor with specific um, delivery roles, but you could also be there as an outside external view to, to help the company perhaps have visibility to things they don't see because they're too much in their own company. And within each of those bands, you can be a change agent. You're expected to be a change agent. You're someone who can understand change, introduce changes, guide toward changes that are beneficial to the company. Uh, you might be a people leader. Uh, this means that you would be a manager of some kind, uh, leading people. But also remember that leadership doesn't necessarily require authority. And so we would think that each SPC is engaged enough and has the skills and you need to grow your skills in how do you lead without authority? And when you do have authority, how do you lead such that the authority is an advantage instead of a disadvantage? And then of course, SPCs and SPCTs are trainers. We are authorized to train and certify in a number of classes. And that helps the organization, especially if you're internal to an organization that allows the organization to get training in a rapid way without high expense. If you're external from the organization, uh, you can offer, um, and you would be doing perhaps training in, a, in the public, but also for private clients. And training is that place, like I said before in my introduction, training is that place where you can trigger those little aha clicks where people start to understand something better than they thought they did. I think I'm done with this one. Great. So one of the things that uh, the handbook highlights in the first sections is the things that you as an SPC should be doing. And we list it on the slide as a must do. Uh, you must, you should update all your certifications or update your SPC to version 6. As you know, uh, Scaled Agile moves along and the, and the framework evolves. And so you don't want to be left behind on a previous version. You want to be on the newest version, the current version, so that you can offer the newest techniques and the content that uh, Scaled Agile comes out with. And also, you benefit from knowing those techniques because they add more finesse and additional techniques that you can apply to your organization and your, or your client. Um, engage with the community. I can't emphasize enough how, how important this has been for my career. When I shifted from being a technical contributor, technical manager kind of roles, to being a coach, I needed to update my skills and user groups, conferences, and all those kinds of things, connections made online, meetups, those were, those were key to make the connections to the people that could help me grow my skills and become more skillful and grow my experiences, as well as connections for my career. Scaled Agile provides a community through the Safe Studio, as they call it now, where there's a number of forms that you can access depending on your certification, etc. And there is a very active SPC form there. So whether or not you engage at the Scaled Agile forms or somewhere else, uh, you should, as the handbook points out, be engaged with the community around you to continue to grow your skills and also help other people to grow. That's an exciting thing to do, and I find that a very exciting thing to do in my, for myself. And then there's an emphasis in the book 
among other things, these are just three highlights, but there's an emphasis in the handbook on how we treat negative criticism or criticism of SAFE. Because SAFE is so large and engaged in so many places, so many companies, it, of course, is a large target. Uh, also, there are many people who seem to have the opinion that scaled agile isn't possible. And, and I don't want to get into all that and, and or be pedantic about it. But the handbook points out that the way we respond to criticism should be a positive, open, learning, exploring kind of way, as opposed to getting into arguments and debates, which can spiral out of control and leave a bad taste um, in others around your brand, your personal brand, and also leave a bad taste with the Scaled Agile community. And we don't want to do that. Um, the ideas in Scaled Agile are beneficial and have been shown to be good for many people in many situations. And they aren't perfect for every situation, and that's fine. But when we uh, behave in a way that causes people to dismiss those ideas when they could have benefited, that's not good for them or us. Hey, so handle those things in a positive way. Yes. I, I did get a private chat um, mm -hmm. asking, what are some of those opportunities to engage actively with the SAFE community? Um, there was the question of what are those avenues? Do you want to, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes. So when you log into SAFE Studio now, there is a, a there's a, can't remember what it's called. Let me look. I can look. Because I'm logged in over here. Um, when you're in Safe Studio, there's a there's a menu down on the left side. One of those menu main menu items is called Connect, and a subset of that is a link called Community Forums. You can go join any number of community forums that have to do with what your certification is, what kind of work you're doing. Like there's a forum for the lace and transformation. There's a forum for architects, safe architects. There's a forum, of course, for safe SPCs. Um, and these are email forms and, and forums online in the web uh, where you can interact, ask questions, respond to questions, make connections, and so on. And so that's what I'm referring to from what Scaled Agile provides. Thank you. Isn't there also there, um, they have, is it, it's monthly where they have their monthly uh, webinars that are usually available for sign up as well. And I believe they, they've also mentioned about their social presence. They are trying to step up their presence on LinkedIn and other social platforms that we should probably connect to. Yes. Um, those are, those are things that you can connect to or sign up for uh, monthly insider mm -hmm. webinars and other things. Um, the, um, I just want to put in, keep an eye on your email because the community will send out information on those events so you can sign up on them for a regular basis. So you should be receiving those. If you're not, then we can take a look into how to support you and making sure you're receiving them. And as well put into the chat in case you missed it about the SPC circle. So that's another great opportunity as well, folks. Yeah. The other cool thing to know, too, is I believe the ones where they have their live meetings, um, obviously, we recognize that for a lot of us, we might not be able to attend those live ones, but they usually do record them and then make those recordings available as well. Much like we're trying to do with this webinar. <laughs> and, and there is, under that Connect menu, there is another link called Summit and Events, and that's a place where you can get information about the different events that happen and the annual SAFE Summit, which is a conference um, held annually somewhere in the world, is a great place to go to to attend a conference right, with mm -hmm. everybody. All right. Any other uh, comments, questions here? Is, uh, I could throw in a little quick question. Is everyone good with uh, version 6 or being upgraded to it? I imagine most of us are at this point, but... If you're not, is there any questions that need to uh, that could support you? All right. I'll I'll make a a comment there on that. If you have a current, if your certification and membership into the Safe community is is current, 
then many of those upgrade paths do not incur additional fees. So you can look into that if you're if you're worried about trying to upgrade and you think it'll cost you extra. Uh, some there are paths that don't cost any extra money if you have a current certification. Great. I think uh, we're over to Tad now. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. So one of the things about this is as you're doing training classes, you're going to get feedback scores. And I, you know, I'm a big, big proponent of read the reviews, the positive and the negative, and then work towards in, improving your scores. Find out where there may be challenges in, in your delivery, where there may be, you know, you're, you're not, you know, you're not presenting as as solidly as you would like, you know, when you start getting these solid results. So we want to really get this 4.0 or higher because, again, this is the premier framework and we're really presenting, you know, ourselves as professionals here. And so, you know, being able to come across and show the knowledge and the experience, because one of the things we're really doing here is showing people all the things that we've gone through and all the lessons we've learned painfully so, you know, getting those, those 4.0 and higher scores is, is really key. Now, the next one there is, of course, the Safe Associates Code of Conduct. And I don't want to go into all the details on that, but that starts on page 28, runs the last few pages. So I'd recommend looking through that. There's really nothing there that's a surprise. So that's kind of, you know, make sure that you're, you're, you're reading through that. Just give it a quick scan. Again, no major surprises there. Nothing out of the ordinary. But one of the things I do want to highlight is that third bullet point, the, the intellectual property. There, there can be some times where you think you might have access to do some things that, that may, in fact, you know, not, they may violate our terms and conditions of being able to use the, the, the material. Sometimes you will see people pull things out of the training material and drop them into public presentations. That's one of the things we have to be careful about. So look through the intellectual property agreements. Make sure you're abiding by those. And, you know, again, I'm sure it's not intentional, but sometimes we slip. So just keep an eye on that. And then last one for this, of course, is the Safe Studio, right? Use the toolkits. I cannot emphasize enough. Uh, Brian heard me talking earlier today about just the, you know, the art identification workshop you know, all, all of the tools around, you know, value stream identification, art, all those things, really great tools. And safe, you know, the, the guys at Scaled Agile have really taken time to build these things for us so we don't have to go out and do these things ourselves. So there's a lot of valuable tools out there. Highly recommend them. You know, again, use Collaborate. Get, you know, even outside of classes, if you need to do a workshop and you want to use one of the Collaborate, please feel free to do that. So... All right. Any questions on this, guys? Again, if you have questions, don't hesitate to speak up. So, no questions. No questions at this point. Just a lot of just agreement and uh, understanding right. that, I, yeah, I, that's the way we need to go. <laughs> oh, I, think I, do have, I, I yeah, do have ahead. a question. Where exactly in Safe Studio would you find your feedback score? So you can go into uh, the the classes after you finish teaching a class and you know okay. it's closed out. There there is a downloadable file that you can get that gets the information from the people who filled out the feedback. Okay. And it'll give you information. You can total up. You can get an average. You, and then it'll also provide comments that the students gave. Okay. So please read those. Absolutely. No. Thank you, Craig. Great question. Yeah, I, I, I want to also put in Craig for that. There is some in the work we have to do as instructors to sort through it because it's going to come into a spreadsheet that's not set up for like creating an average mm -hmm. or understanding what it is. Yeah. So there is some fiddling with that to get it at the moment. We currently do not have an SPC like dashboard where we have our current rating score visible for us okay. at the moment. Um, sometimes you may be able to connect with whichever partner you're working with and they can sometimes provide you with some more detailed information um, that they may have. So maybe one of these events, we could have somebody from Scaled Agile here that, that we could have them take that back to Scaled Agile about maybe a dashboard. <laughs> yeah. I, I would love that. that. 
<laughs> yeah, there's actually been some information in the chat, um, ultimately asking, you know, as we've gone through our enablement, folks just maybe chime in via the chat. Have you actually read the, the legal ease? And then um, Phil rightly remembers, reminds us too that um, those of us that are associated with a partner like Engaged Agility or with anyone else, um, you can also ultimately look on the partner site. Yeah, Matt, do you, you could probably speak to this a little bit because there is information that Matt can see that relates to where we're standing as instructors. Matt, do you have, would you like to put in? Yeah, so as as a as a business lead, we get access to all of the people all of the people that have their uh, professional email associated with, in my case, engaged engaged agility. So I can go in and look, and it it does give me averages. Um, it's a rolling, and they've changed it, and I don't remember what it is now. I think it's a rolling year, 365 days. For a while, they were doing rolling 90 days, showing who who had taught classes and what their average was, and then there's also a line that shows how many classes they've taught. So like right now, Brian's got, I don't know, 36 classes on there. And then you can look at his average and his average is a 4.9 and a, a 4.9 on knowledge and a 4.9 on whatever the other, the other, it's knowledge and help me out somebody. Facilitation, isn't it? It's training and facilitation and skills and versus it. knowledge. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So it shows, it shows that breakout. What I, what I wish they had. I wish I could click a button and it would pull up all of his scores and all of his comments. And when I asked, they just kind of chuckled as if to say, why, why would we be able to get technology to that? But it's all good. They're working on it and they're making it better every day. Used to, we not, I'd say what a year and a half ago, we didn't even have access to that. So continuous improvement one step at a time. They, they did make an improvement, Matt, that you may not know of. You actually have a drop down for the range now. So you can determine, oh. hey, I want to see my people or this person for 30, 60, 90, 180, or 365. Ooh, very nice. Sorry. Don't mean to hijack. <laughs> no, good. we love the information. Thank you, sir. All right. Excellent. Hey, I'm glad that we, we had some good discussion around this. So, All right. right, let's. Um, can we take the next one, please, sir? All right. So... Up, you know, potentially upcoming in the future. This is something that's kind of been talked about in the background, I know, for a while. But they may eventually start adding continuing education requirements to, to you know, keep your, um, keep your credential up to date. So keep in mind, keep looking back here for that information. So if they start, you know, bringing that in, obviously they're going to make a pretty good size announcement about it. But this will be the place you'll want to keep an eye out for it. So understand that continuing education may become a thing in the future. All right. All right, then that brings it over to me and let's have more of a conversation about like the copyright material and leveraging safe content. Uh, I'd love to get an idea of how everybody feels about this because I know when I first came in, I started probably breaking the rules here all over the place. And I like, um, and I, I, I maybe should not say that too much, but it is the reality. And um, it is really good for us to understand what is, allowed and what's not allowed in terms of being like uh, appropriate for class material versus presentations. How many people are training right now? Got show of hands. Okay. So we've got some, because the training content that we're going through, right? One of the things that we, it's very good to know is unless somebody has a license to sit in that class, we do not want to be giving the material of that class to them. Just like that's a really good idea to hold or know. Um, toolkits are a great place to leverage the material from. If you have access to the toolkits, use those up when either you're talking, giving a presentation, working with clients in any way, shape, or form. That is your place to go, by the way. That is a really great source for material that you can leverage. And here's another thing. If you're going to rewrite any content, you're going to take images or anything, include the copyright mark. So those are like three really great easy ones for us to remember. And then I want to go through these and make sure we have... Oh, by the way, there's a link down here. And um, 
We'll get it put into the chat as well. Uh, there's some really good content, frequently asked questions as related to permissions. But here's seven of them that are worthwhile for us to just quickly go over and have a discussion for comprehension, just to make sure we're on the same page. So I'm going to read through them. Safe content may not be used to create other training and services or, oh, Phil, do you want me to ask I, I don't, wait, wait till you're done. Wait till you're done, man. Okay. Uh, training or services or anything that complete uh, competes with scaled agile so offerings or service. Safe content, graphics, and trademarks may only be used in connection with scaled agile safe services, training, and courses. All right. Any questions on that? Is that one pretty, pretty clear? You don't want to take anything and then create competitive material from it or use it to like go against, right? I, I think that, that one's a little self-explanatory, I, I imagine. Anybody's got questions, make sure you raise their hand. Phil. I'll just tell you that um, when in doubt, ask, um, because technically speaking, um, being able to take an image off of the website and put it into anything um, is subject to Scaled Agile's IP. Yeah. Um, they put a JavaScript piece on their site, so if you try and highlight something and you copy it, it reminds you that you're copywriting something copyright. So as an SPC, if you ever want to use something from Scaled Agile's website, um, you've got a little bit more flexibility because it's publicly facing content and that, that attribution usually works. If you want to use anything from a toolkit, there's a permissions request that you'll need to submit. As an SPC, you'll need to be very specific on how you want to use that toolkit content. When it comes to the classroom content, you can try to request something via permissions, but um, I, I used to think it was impossible. Now that I'm, now I'm a fellow, I, I've seen that it is possible, but it's very, very strict. And so... Just understand this. This is I, I love the fact that the Engage Agility team is providing you with this content because this is one of the things that can really make your SPC journey bumpy. Um, and so I uh, just wanted to point that out. That permissions form. I put the link into chat, and they're awesome. pretty quick. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, here here's the thing. We, we are, are like safeguarding the information of what <laughs> what we're doing. I'm going to emphasize if you're in doubt, connect with them. Let go get permission, right? I think that's a great, great practice. Thank you, Phil. Uh, we have another raised hand, Terry. Terry, you are not coming through sound-wise. Nope, not yet. <laughs> Write it in chat, bud, and I'll once it's posted, I'll I'll get it. We we deliberately did that to you, Terry. We just wanted to make sure because we knew you'd hijack the thing. <laughs> yeah, type it up in chat and we'll get it. I, I, we're getting that. Don't worry about it. Yeah, he's, um, saying, go, he's saying move on. All right. Yeah, we'll, we'll take care of okay. it. Okay. All right. Next one, safe graphics may not be modified, including the template format, font, color, graphics, and text. I know there can be uh, possibly, especially, like, here's something that I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I did not follow for, completely when I started teaching courses and there was some material that I kind of like, oh, I'm going to help put this over onto Miro to be able to facilitate a course. And I don't think it was in alignment with their material. So keep that in mind. We want to make sure that as we're doing something, if a graphic is being used, let's use the graphic exactly as it has been created. All right. Any questions around that one? Okay. I'd like to ask a question on behalf of the group. Um, I'm a firm believer in having big picture sort of views for, for the students. And sometimes a lot of the course material does not include that. Or, and it, how about about putting things together for them from that standpoint of helping to see um, as we're going through that, that reminder that, hey, you know what, this piece connects to this piece that connects to this piece so that you kind of get that big picture view. Now we're going to dive into it a little bit 
and they can start again so many folks that they either come from they need to see the forest before they start going into the trees and vice versa and sometimes that is missing use the big picture for that yeah i see what phil is saying and that's what we usually do is i have to admit i go there from them but sometimes then they get confused on the big big picture and start going down rabbit trails <laughs> awesome all right really great um next one a copyright embedded in safe graphics must be maintained and not obscured um i'm going to flip back a couple we've got images where i'm going to put the copyright safe ink do you see it as it's on these presentations so if we're going to be using them we got to make sure we bring that coffee right over you're going to see it as embedded in this graphic here oh sorry does everybody see how it's in the bottom right corner Got to make sure that we bring those along with any image if it's going to be used or leveraged over. Um, any questions? All right. The following copyright notice must be included on any reproduction of safe content. So as Phil was mentioning, if you take a paragraph or a couple sentences from the safe website or something, we need to see the, the, the copyright scaled agile ink in alignment with that content because it is coming from safe okay so whether doesn't matter if it's just not an image but if it's part of the content and as, the, as i said that that's often going to give you a little notification that this is safe copyright material if you if you do that okay any questions on that one okay here's one that is a little bit more tricky i found the red the r um trademark symbol is superscript font must be inserted after safe and scaled agile framework in headings or where first used in body content. Do you see how at the top here we have safe and then the R symbol is part of it? So the first time we see safe in body or in heading, it needs to have that R symbol, which is something that I think a lot of us may have not known or skip over. Any questions? No question, but Terry was able to kind of chat in, I think, some of his information if you wanted to kind of maybe reinforce this with folks. So people get caught up in the copyright issue. Since information is not copyrightable, just the expression. Some of us forget that as SPCs and license holders, we have a separate agreement with SAI and enforceable outside of potential copyright violations. Uh, so, so speaking as representatives and SPCs, there is a higher degree of um, how we hold uh, integrity with the material I'm, I'm getting rather than if we were external and what they can get away with. <laughs> is that accurate, Terry? Ish? Okay. If I, if I haven't got that spot on, let me know. Um, I'm, I'm also like, continuously learning what I may not be. <laughs> yeah, I've got exactly correct as well. So I'm um, letting Terry ease for you. So uh, I'm watching the, the body language. <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, the following attributes must be included. Safe and Skilled Agile Frameworks are registered trademarks of Skilled Agile Inc. And a hyperlink to the original work on the SAFE website, which is continuously revised and updated, must be included, um, especially if you're referencing that content. All right, I'm gonna pass it back over to Tam. Unless there's more copyright or how to leverage material. Actually, Tam, before we do one more thing, this is talking more about the um, copyright material uh, intellectual property. Does anybody have any questions related to delivering content as a trainer or as a consultant in different means like Miro versus uh, Collaborate versus PowerPoint, because that can sometimes have questions that are coming up for our trainers and consultants. I'm just pausing to see if anything comes up through the chat. Feel free to either raise your hands, guys, or just unmute yourself. I'm going to give, okay, it looks like we're, we're good. If you ever need to reach out and ask questions, um, <laughs> awesome, Terry. Terry's giving us some, like, uh, 
he's got stuff from law school about IP on gay systems. I love D&D, so we'll, we can chat later in the future, Terry. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, here, here's something that was really advised to me, especially if you're a newer SPC, leverage and use the Collaborate tool first and foremost. That's going to be your best bet if you can uh, master that. And it's very much in alignment with what Scaled Agile is looking for us to be able to use and use well. All right. Tim? Yeah, so guys, what we're going to do is open up the uh, breakout room so that you can choose. It's totally up to you. Uh, Ryan will be uh, moderating uh, room one where SPCs as change agents. Uh, room two will be with Alan, uh, SPCs as people leaders. And then room three is going to be with Tad on SPCs as trainers. And this will give you the chance to kind of go in, talk with the uh, community, and ultimately, if you find that, you know what, I've kind of meant this and I want to go talk to somebody else, you are more than welcome to. We're going to make this completely and utterly open for you and just really and truly have the ability for us to, again, have conversation in a smaller group um, and give you that opportunity to kind of maybe just chat from that standpoint of what does it mean? What does it mean to be a change agent? What does it mean to be a people leader? And what does it mean to be a trainer? So I'm gonna open the rooms up and you guys get to choose. Ones that uh, between us as a panel have gone over in red and there's the ones that we consider probably in the top tier of like, if you're gonna choose some books to read, maybe read these ones first. They're all valuable. Um, I definitely, we can talk about, in, uh, you can make a note of them. We're happy to answer questions on these. I definitely, um, the goal is a great one to get started on when looking at concepts of flow, whip limits, small batch sizes, all this stuff that um, might be like, why in the world does that work? Like if you played the penny game, now you can talk about it a little bit better um, after going through that. Now, once you've read the goal, if you want to understand the dynamics, more than 99% of the people out there read Principles of Product Development Flow. It is a dry read, and it could be painful, but it is golden in terms of content. I have it always on hand to show students because this is, it's, it's so valuable. I personally then think the value stream mapping team topologies and extreme ownership are the next. Like Those would be the top tier for me. Um, and then after that, moving into project to product, accelerate, start avoiding a train wreck, turn the ship around, the five dysfunctions of a team, lean startup, Phoenix project. Uh, my panelists or fellow webinar leaders here, any comments or want to talk about anything here? I'm a Brian, I, I, Yeah, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank, thanks. So last night there was a local meetup here in San Antonio. And the gentleman that's running it, he is um, working to get his internal SPCT um, designation. And he was talking about going to his his interview. Um, and he said he was up there. He was supposed to present. I forget the topic uh, that he was supposed to present on. But he was presenting on it. And uh, Dean said, uh, excuse me, Jeff, but have you read the book, The Lean Machine? <laughs> And Jeff was like, well, no, I haven't, but but I read, and he filled it in with some other book that, that he had read, and then he kept explaining the topic. And he said that afterwards, Dean pulled him aside and said, hey, go read the book and tell me if you would change anything about the way that you described that. And he said it was so insightful after he read it to understand that, like, he was like, I could see Dean reading this book and then going, let me apply it in in the framework here. He was like, it, it was just so, so clear. So just know that as you read through these, you can you can go and you can pick out pieces of the framework. It's like, oh, chapter seven, that is this part of the framework right over here. And it's, it's kind of cool to be able to make some of those connections. There, um, as SPCs and especially as trainers and, and then change agents and leaders, if we want to lead the content well, we need to know like the background for me. I also have ADHD and I love to know the why behind things. And you go through our safe material and it's the tip of the iceberg in terms of the content. And most of our principles and practices are from where they're from these books. 
Mm -hmm. So you want to understand how to talk about it better. You want to understand how to communicate, how to lead a transformation, how to coach and how to teach better. Go master the content better so you can talk. That's my recommendation. Number one thing, go like, go immerse yourself in this and it will support you in anything that you're doing as an SPC, in my opinion, at least. Anyone else? <laughs> Thoughts, questions, topics, concerns? Anybody read any of these books that want to like praise how good they were? I'm going to talk about team uh, ownership, but everybody knows that, that my big old soapbox is servant leadership. So that's the number one book right there is Extreme Ownership and follow it up with the, the Dichotomy of Leadership as well. So Yeah, by Junko Willings, right? They're both yep. Yeah, yep. fantastic books. Yep. Leadership realm. I really enjoy the art of avoiding a train wreck. Sometimes it's, there's a lot of value in knowing what not to do rather than trying to follow a recipe. Know not to do this and then don't do it. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, that's a really great point, Craig, as point yeah. like SPCs. We're all about continuous like learning and relentless improvement, right? right? When do we learn is when things are going south is often when we learn the most. So leverage it <laughs> by reading and paying, paying attention like, oh, I wouldn't have done it this way. Okay, cool. Great. Now I know that for moving forward. Like, it's okay for it to fail as long as we're learning from it, right? right. There's economical value in failure, as you would learn in principles of product development flow. Mm -hmm. All right, you sold me on that book. I don't have that one yet, but uh, I'm going to get it. Jump on Amazon right after the meeting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, and Phil's showing uh, the art of avoiding a train wreck. All right. This, awesome. is, this is How Pretty Agile Launches Arts. That's what this book is. This is one of the first safe fellows, basically her and her partner saying, this is how I do it. And if you know M um, and you want her to come help your company, mm -hmm. that's how she's doing it or she's not helping you. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, she's, she's, it's funny. The older you, the longer you've been doing this, the saltier you get. You get, you get, you get, you get more. <laughs> yep. I follow picky. her on LinkedIn. She, she's great. Yeah. She, so she's one of the people, you know, I talk about the, the community in, in the breakout we were in. She's one of the people that I, I asked her with questions. Mm -hmm. And it was, Nashville was last year, right, Brian? Um, yeah. 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 So um, she told me last year, she's like, I don't, I don't hate you anymore. I was like, thank you. <laughs> You've been drinking quite a bit. And, and she's like, you used to irritate the people who sleep out of me. And I go, but, but I love you. And she gave me a big hug and everything. And it, it's, it's funny because. You know, while she probably doesn't remember that, for me, it was very humbling because this is a person that I looked up to that I followed. I mean, back in the day, there was M. Campbell Pretty, Mark Richards, Eric Willicke, and a couple other people that were early on that journey. And they gave me the gift of their time in little five, 10 minute increments over the course of a couple of years. And so, you know, these the, the advice that, that Ryan and, and, and Tad and others have given you is really spot on. This is all about the the journey, the SPC is the start of it, not the end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, be afraid, very afraid of people who say, <laughs> I can do this. I'll lead your transformation. I'm an SPC. You know, I, I took Brian's class last week. You know, so anyway. So fun fact about that book. Tad and I used to work with one of the guys that wrote one of the forwards. Remember Don? Tad? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah when I read the books, like, I pinged him and says, hey, I'm reading your book, Don. Nice forward. So, uh. It really, you know, made it personable, personal for me. It occurs to me, though, guys, that folks nowadays don't necessarily want to read big books. They want, they need their videos, they need their audios. And I know that a lot of these books don't have their audio versions yet, and they're not necessarily predisposed to it. So maybe we as a community need to maybe think about what we can refactor and, and revitalize from that standpoint of sharing these concepts, maybe in a newer way for the, 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 you know, the times so that it gets out there to more folks. I think there's some possibilities, Tam, that we can create around that that I would love to see in terms of community of practice or, sh well, knowledge sharing in terms of amongst mm -hmm. us. So let's, well, we'll play. Well, I, I've got some ideas. All right. Are we good with this? Then finally, 
Well, Q except for Terry's comment over there, I like big books and I cannot lie. <laughs> <laughs> you other SBC can't Ooh. deny. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. Uh, all right. Tam, are we? I think we, yeah, it's Q&A time, guys. So, and also maybe if you guys, before we go into Q&A, if each of the leads for each of the breakouts would maybe just do a little synopsis of how the conversations went and so that we can capture that for the recording and then we can go into Q&A. Sure. So, Ryan, uh, can you so go little, first? Yeah. Yeah, a little synopsis. Um, I might need some people to prompt my memory. Um, we were taking a look at... If you're a new SPC and you're going to start your journey and you may have some expertise in some area like product management, um, what's some best ways to leverage your expertise but also begin to gaining more of the skills of like how do I lead a safer teams when that's not been my realm of expertise? Like and how do I uh, go through additional content and add it to so that I'm able to provide that there is some, and Phil provided some really great guidance that we do not need to be an expert on everything, right? We have a, a group of SPCs. There is a community of us. And I'm like, there's a, something one of my uh, uh, my mentors says that is, I, I love this concept of strong opinions weekly help. I'm like, if you can give me better reasons for a, a better way of doing something or different, I'm happy to give up my perspective, but I'm going to do the work to understand my um my uh, knowledge or what I'm offering. So there was a, a conversation around that. Also, as coming into SPCs for the first time, what's the best way to approach it? Because we had um, uh, one of the gentlemen on the call who is coming into, I think it's Brian's SPC class coming up in a short bit. So coming in and setting themselves up for how to become an SPC and then the next steps there. That's uh, we could probably dive in. Like, I can't recreate the whole. No, that's fine. Thing. No, I think that's great. That works. Yeah. yeah. Um, so room two was Alan. It was the SPCs as people leaders. Can you maybe just sum it up with a little bit? Yeah. So we, we had really interesting discussion about, you know, of course, servant leadership came up, but also how do you be, an SBC leader, or how do you behave as a leader if perhaps the organization you are in uh, only sees you as someone that helps to set up arts and lead PI planning events, right? If if the organization is restricting you to certain expectations, how do you be a leader? And we talked about how you can be a mentor, you can be an example of lean agile values, you can do those things even if you don't have authority or the broad mandate to do those things. Uh, and so that's an exciting thing that we landed on, among all, all kinds of other things to talk about. But that that was the gist that I got from it, and I enjoyed hearing from the uh, participants around that. Awesome, awesome. Uh, in room three, uh, SPCs as trainers, Tad. Okay, well, uh, well, we started off with a good conversation about the self-selection as a trainer, and that really got us into, you know, the idea of, being a new SPC and then teaching for the first time, and that can be a very nerve-wracking experience. And again, the, the, what we recommend is talk to somebody who's been through the class. Ideally, take a class with that person or have them co-train with you can be a great thing because when you're standing up there the first time, it is very unnerving. And I know that you know those of us who've been through this know what that's like. You stand up in the front of the room and you realize that you're now the expert, and you're not really sure how much of an expert you really are. Hmm. So, I, I, again, I remember my first class, and I was just terrified the first day. And uh, I rapidly realized, okay, they're looking to me as the expert, so I've got to stand up and do that role. So, absolutely, just, you know, recognize, get it, you know, getting the support you need, talking to other instructors, and particularly how certain situations, you know, how to deal with certain situations. And um, the other thing is also to know when not to teach. Uh, Brian has a good example of maybe that, you know, teaching a class right now is not the best thing. Um, I also sometimes recognize that there are instructors who know areas better than I do. And I would much rather provide that experience and say, look, 
you can take this class from me, but I'm going to point you to my colleague and you're going to get a better experience. And I think the best thing to do is recognize that the important thing there is provide the best value for the students, even at our own expense. Mm -hmm. So did I miss anything, guys? Uh, I would, Can I add, Tad, that I, um, I just want to echo for all of it, there's a lot of great resources here from people and engaged agility and stuff, and a lot of us are super happy to contribute and talk mm -hmm. and support reach out you got a community of people here that are happy to help i'm never unwilling to talk as anybody around me ever knows sometimes they wish i'd, t I'd do it a little bit less so. awesome i don't wish that <laughs> thank you darnell awesome well thank you guys for summing that up i think we're going to open it up for panel q a so this is the open time uh, for you guys to take advantage of all of these folks here and pretty much ask any question that you have. Oh, Phil, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead and just ask? Yeah, so for the panel, you know, SPC is doing training and somebody asks you a question and you really don't know the answer. How do you respond to that? I I can tell you for mine, if, if then don't mind me jumping in, um, one of my favorite ways is not fully saying I don't know, but I'd be like, you know what? That's a really great question. I'm not sure if I have the best answer for you. I'm going to go find out, and I'm going to let you come back and give you an update. Because that gives me permission. Maybe at the end of the day, I can go, or I'm going to follow up with an email. But I want to make sure that I'm giving them the correct information. And I don't be like, oh, I just don't know. But it's more like, well, let me just double check. I'm going to get you the right information rather than... Yeah, I particularly like your answer, Ryan, because saying I don't know is great, but you, you they're just like, uh, and you, you offered, but I'm going to go find out and get back to you. That's yeah. that's powerful. Yeah. Bill's, Bill's follow-up question is really good because I think I think all of us have probably been hit with that because you want you want to be authentic, you want to be able to tell people that I don't know, but then there are situations when you say I don't know. And that loses you a contract, or that loses you that follow it up engagement. So I, so feel, so I feel, I feel, I feel you. <laughs> I, I, I understand where you're coming from because I've been there. I think Brian's got his hand up. I'll, I'll. Well, no, Terry. I want to before Brian, we get to Brian. Quick question for you, Terry. What's your efficacy going to be with a client that's going to terminate you or not have you stay if you say you don't know? You're not going to be effective with them anyway. Yeah, it's it. That was a. It was. You need probably to fire your client, but <laughs> well, I mean, I, I guys no, but you recognize right. no. the fact that my client possibilities now are much different than they were ten years ago. So I don't want to be, you know, ivory tower on anybody. I'm just saying though that no, you're recogni right, yeah. recognizing the fact that if you can't be transparent, you can't you can't emulate the four one of the, you know one of the core four core values of safe right it, and is transparency. And, um, you know, I know Brian and Brian and I worked together in the past and he's he's seen a VP react to me flat out saying to somebody very high up in the government. I don't know. I'll find out. Mm -hmm. right. Brian. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I was going to say, if you don't mind hanging on, the thing is, you always have to follow up. Right. That's mm -hmm. the 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 main thing. I don't know is is not to me. I don't know is not a valid answer if it's not followed up with. But I'll find out. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Brian because I'm going to keep talking if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Me and you feel apparent uh, we're birds of a feather. Yeah, the um, just a follow-up question here, and this is some, you know, it's great conversation here, but what I wonder is how do we recognize that we need to say I don't know? What are some indicators that you might see? How do you actually turn that into an internal perspective so that you're making sure that you're looking at yourself and recognizing Hey, I don't actually know. I'm just talking sometimes. How do you do that in the middle of a class? Let me ask you that. How do how do I do that in the middle of talking to a client or a customer? So if if I jump in here, um, I've I've received feedback in some of my classes, particularly in the in person classes anyway, uh, where one of the complaints I've seen a couple of times is that I pause too much. And but but other people say that's great and. But I have learned that with my brain, sometimes when I get hit with a, a question I wasn't expecting or some situation comes up, 
I do have to pause, like, and I don't mean stand there for 15 seconds, maybe for five seconds, but I have to stand there and do a catalog and say, okay, am I about to make up something or do I actually know? Um, and then, and then I'd reach into my bag of experience. Well, are there things that are like this maybe anyway? So my first step to answer your question would be, I need to stop and think. I need to pause and think. I have a sticky of it, in fact. <laughs> Pause, sense, think, speak. It's a good sense making stick. Yeah, I like it. Uh, I would add, I think being vulnerable and calling one on yourself can be in very endearing and building um, connection with people. Mm -hmm. So being like, hey, you know what? <laughs> I think I'm talking out of my, right? <laughs> uh, I'm going to stop what I'm saying and like just talking out of my right? ear. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I don't know what y'all were inserting there, but we're talking out of our ear. <laughs> But it just it, makes us a lot more human and then it becomes mm -hmm. a lot more relatable when we can come back with like an answer. I know I, at least I find that for myself. Yeah. The, the only times I've ever really been bitten by this was when you're teaching a class and you say, I don't know, I'll find out. And then you get the, uh, you, you get your feedback and this person didn't know what they were talking about. You're like, what? No, I had one thing that I didn't know, but yeah, it, the, what I found is I, I got a lot. There, there's always going to be somebody in the class that I teach that doesn't like my accent they don't like my chipperness they don't like that i'm kind of loose or whatever and and, and so just go with it but yeah i i i guess the 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 whole thing is like i'm with phil i, I was like I, I would rather i would rather be honest and, and authentic yes I'm, i may lose a couple of clients but in the long run i probably i probably didn't need those anyway or or whatnot so I, I try to remember the parking lot thing that we, when we taught these classes in person, you know, that was like, you know, 100, mm -hmm. 200 years, whatever it was ago. Um, you, you you give them that visual, you know, uh, when you're doing mind mapping or you're doing story mapping or whatever. The, the ideas that didn't stick, they're still up there on the wall. They didn't just get dismissed. So I don't know when I'll follow up is at the end of the class, I try to send everyone. Here's the questions that were asked. There was not an immediate answer. I'll close back up with folks who shared email. Here's what I discovered from one of you, somebody else, whatever. Kind of in spirit of what Ryan said. So that 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 visual of I will fall back with you is all you can do. And then if they still ding you for it. Eh. It's one of the uh, just just as a point to come back to our principles and practices, like the idea of getting rid of the fear of failure. It's a very important part of what we're up to, right? having the psychological safety to fail forward and have the relationship with ourselves and our classes that that's okay. I think we create that when we first start training and teaching and being able to do that provides the space for them later on. I've actually had the pleasure to teach with Terry. And I think one of the uh, things that really resonates with me is, is how genuine he is. Right. And, and people really respond to that and they find it really um, endearing and engaging too. So and I think that really, builds that that let that like someone said it before the transparency and even that slight you know level of trust it's like he doesn't know he's honest with me he's going to find me an answer i like that and i didn't pay craig more than five dollars to say that no, no he has my venmo account we're, we're cool <laughs> <laughs> is it just me or if you just look at brian i don't know you brian it, his eyes are sparkling he looks like he's been told a joke and he wants to share right and then and you he's see been matt. up since 3 a.m yeah you see matt you know yeah. matt reminds me of kindigant designs one of my favorite car shows you know the owner and he's always that same look you'll see you just go watch it one episode you know? so um, there, there was another question I, that phil put in the chat that was Sorry. asking about what about um do you share your mistakes do you share your mistakes I think absolutely, because part of the reason these students are coming in to learn these classes is we've learned things often from painful experience that I'd rather that people not do, you know, I, I want to be on, you know, be honest and say, hey, look, this this didn't go so well. I kind of, you know, I joke occasionally and say that the way I learned agile is by doing it wrong every possible way. And so I want people to to, to you know, to not have to go through all the experience that I did. So. 
So I'm not going to try and put anybody on the spot, but I just want to give an opportunity for other folks that have been a little bit more quieter and um, not maybe had a chance to speak that if you want to go ahead and unmute and ask some other questions or share some of your observations or some of your learnings, we would love to have you included. I just, as a good coach, I want to make sure all voices are being heard. I guess uh, from my perspective as kind of... uh on the path actively in the course right now uh, with uh, two of the fine individuals on the call here. I guess looking to the group, what advice would you give a new SPC? Like if you had to pick one piece of advice of what should you do first and what should you definitely not do? Um, So I'll jump in. That was quiet long enough for me to jump in. Um, First, Find a community or a person that can be your mentor and with them explore your next learnings. What what do you want or need to learn next? That's that's my short advice. My little advice is find your group, find your crew. Um, when you have people that even beyond just a mentor, but if you have people that are strong as part of your team, that have your back that can support you, but can support that client. I think that's just such a win-win situation, not only for you, but anybody that you're working with. Build your tribe. Yep. Build your tribe. I can share my experience here very quickly. Uh, I'm an USBC. I became an SBC after a class with Brian and Sam Burn became an SBC in January kind of took time off to get that certification and, and really study for it. Uh, but my experience was that as soon as I got the SPC, the doors opened up to me to learn what more, uh, how many more SPCs were in my So just gaining that, that SPC gave me the door to learn who is the community in my organization. And from there, we gaining that mentorship, gaining that supporting, I, I found that the SPC is very, community is very willing to help you grow. That, that's been my experience. It's just once you become part of the, of the community, there's a lot of people who can help you guide your path. On the flip side, I think part of your question was what not to do. Um, I wouldn't take your foot off the gas. So I'd be like, continuous learning. Continuous like involvement in community, uh, the 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 community. Um, taking a look at what's next. It's okay to pause a little bit, but sometimes when we pause and let it go too long, then we step away. Um, but I found I'm like yeah, build almost like what I think building a roadmap for yourself would be valuable. What do you want to master next? How are you adding it to it? Where are you going? Create a vision for yourself. Um, that can be very valuable where you want to go and then making sure you're consistently taking steps towards. I have a question for the panel. What do you guys think in today's climate of where they're literally, there's studies saying that um, the demand and the need for enterprise coaches, coaches in general is not necessary and the market is super saturated. Do you see that there's still a place for us? So I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one because I've been unemployed five months. And so I, I think that coming from that statement, and that this is other than pandemics never happened to me in my working life. Um, I think there's a lot of emotional reaction to AI and they're saving money and they killed consultants and blah, blah, blah. My bottom line from what I know and what I've read is they just put 20 years effort into trying to be agile, do agile. That's a huge investment in corporate America. They're not just going to go, I didn't work. Let's try something else. I just don't believe that. Maybe I don't feel desperate. I just, that's my faith part of, I do what I do to try to help people do their jobs easier. And I think there's always going to be a need for what we're reaching out to them and have to offer. I am. I'd probably like echo what Darnell said. Well, at least I don't know about anybody else, but actually going in and seeing how organizations are often working, they're they're not masterful in terms of uh, the principles and practices of agile and lean and DevOps. Like it just 
it occurs to me that we're far away from having a world that is like highly effective at it. So I'm curious what, is it a marking component, right? Like doing, like, I think it would be curious for me to see how we move more into the business agility and making sure that that is getting announced and communicated. Um, I think I'm going to be taking efforts of like, how do we make sure we have leadership and conversations, not just related to the software side of things, but I think there, I think we need to like, how do, how do we speak into the other uh, markets or parts of the market that haven't been listening for agile and lean and the components? I, I don't, that's my two cents. Can I, can I throw something in? Yeah. Um, I call it the Marco effect. Brian remembers that. So there are, there are companies out there that will hire somebody and slap the SPC on them, stick them out there at a customer and hope that everything goes well. Right. And that was a big way of, of doing things at a lot of the big consulting companies, one of which I used to work for. And firsthand, I've seen the damage that that can do. And I think what we're experiencing now, besides the economic situ uncertainty and, and, and AI and things like that, but there's a, a little bit of a blowback back against the, 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 the commoditization. Um, and, you know, we're seeing more and more, I want to know who you are. I want to understand what people are you bringing? What, what are their individual backgrounds? I worked for a COO at one point, and Brian's going to smile here, who said, an SPC is an SPC is an SPC. We can hire whoever, just give them their SPC, and then they can do what you and Brian do, right? And it, people aren't interchangeable like that. And we all have different experiences. There are clients out there that are going to love somebody who talks as much as Terry. Other ones are going to love people who talk as much as Darnell, right? And the reality is, is that there's probably people there that would like both of them. And if you have a team of all Darnells or a team of all Terry's, you know, you're not covering all bases. And so what I've, my experience has been that think of safe as a vehicle, not the destination. And as new SPCs focused on safe, everything's about safe. Have Brian tell you someday about what happened when he was coaching a group of SPCs in the government and an, a memo came out saying, um, avoid rigid and prescriptive frameworks like safe. And Brian can tell you what his SPCs he was working with decided was the best way to combat that particular thing. But find out what outcomes your customers want. And if you'd connect with them on that level, wield safe as the vehicle, as the tool that you use to get there, but focus on their outcomes, not, not the destination. And I believe that there's, that there's still a market out there, but connecting with those people and finding those people can be tough. Mm -hmm. Off to you, Brian. Well, no, I can, yeah, I can share. Yeah, that was a... That experience that Phil was talking about there, um, more or less, folks started creating a PowerPoint almost immediately that said, safe says, safe says, safe says. And I go over and I'm looking, I'm like, what's going on here? So I go walk up to Phil, I'm like, hey, you might want to, you might want to come and be part of this conversation. And he comes over and we start looking and we're like, yeah, we, we, we probably want to rethink how we're approaching this, <laughs> right? How we're, how we're um, wording this and what, what, what kind of a, what kind of facade we're putting off. Um, we ended up having a conversation, I believe, that um, a few folks ended up actually going and having a conversation with this person, the self-titled czar of the Air Force, uh, software czar of the Air Force. So, guys, I know we've gone a little over, but it's been such wonderful conversation when we don't want to necessarily cut it short. So if you're willing to go on, we can, but we do have a few folks that are having to drop off. Thank you so much. And uh, we really loved all of the conversation and the, the chance to get connected with everybody. So, you know, stay agile, stay lean. <laughs>